dissatisfaction in you and uh, dissatisfaction in the right way in the right areas it's always in life it's always a bad place to be when you come to a place of complacency and we as believers need to guard very very carefully against being satisfied with less than we could give to God and with just what we have or what we're doing. And we ought to always be asking God, God, is there more? And God, can I have more? And God, would you, would you have me to do more? And uh, I want to read just the beginning of our text this evening, actually the ending of our text, beginning down at verse 27 of Matthew chapter 19. The scripture says, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Well, let's pray and we'll ask God's help. God, we do need your help both understanding some doctrinal technical aspects of the Scripture. But more than anything, God, we need your help by your Holy Spirit to have the conviction that we need in order to even desire 
to see the things that are promised in your word here today. We just thank you so much for this book, for the word, and for the anticipation that we have that you're going to do a work now in this hour. And we just trust you for it, asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the tail end of the rich man. It's easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let me just ask you uh, I, I, uh, just a personal question. What does it mean to be rich? Actually. It's kind of a relative term, isn't it? Like, I don't know how many of you consider yourself to be well off. Some people never consider, no matter how much they have, they never consider that they have enough or that they're wealthy or well off. And others, uh, sometimes it just depends on what the comparison is. And sometimes they feel like, if I had this, I'd be what I'd call rich. But then when they have it, it seems as though, well, it's not quite what I thought it would be. And then they compare themselves with perhaps someone else that has more. And they realize, okay, I'm not as rich as I want to be or as, as I would be. The fact of the matter is it's a relative term, isn't it? It's in comparison with... I have, I have Facebook friends from around the world. and I have Facebook friends uh, who, though Taj and I dispute whether or not Facebook friendships are legitimately friendships or not. We have this discussion or not. You know, I, I call them fake friends, fake book friends, whatever, fake friends on Facebook and so forth. But I have some people on Facebook. I probably know maybe 1,500 of the people who are my friends on Facebook. Maybe that's how many I know. But then I have about, oh, 3,000 or so people uh, that I don't know, maybe, maybe 3,500 people that I don't know that are my Facebook friends. And to the ones that I do know sometimes interact with me on Facebook sometimes, but the ones I don't know interact with me or try to interact with me all the time. I have to delete, I, don't, I can't keep the little app, you know, where they can send you messages. can't have it on my phone because my phone goes bing, 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 all day long, all night long, literally 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. They're all around the world. And they're all uh, trying to get me to fund them. So I have uh, friends in Nepal, in Pakistan, fake friends, I'm saying, uh, and some of them are, are uh, Christians. They're, they're, they're wonderful people, actually. And you, you find out a little bit about them. But Nepal, Pakistan, and then all the countries of Africa, Somalia, Uganda, Rwanda, um, you know, just all over the place. And they send me requests for money all the time, just all the time. And, you know, they add you on Facebook. And then first time, you know, if you, if you accept them as a friend, then they send you a personal you know, hey, God bless you, um, or, uh, you know, I like to praise the Lord, you know, that the first thing they say, praise the Lord. And I always ask, why? <laughs> I'm a, you know, I have an inherently sarcastic personality character. <laughs> well, because we ought to praise the Lord, I say, well, then go ahead, you know, do it, you know. <laughs> but why are you telling me? <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, what does that have to do with me? Why are you? Why are you telling me you're going to praise the Lord? You have my permission, if that's what you're looking for. I always tell them, you have my permission. Go ahead. You know, so <laughs> I'm a hard nut to crack. Uh, anyway, uh, when I actually look at their lives, do you have a question, Frank? I'm a little bit confused on why are they asking you for money? Because I'm an American. Oh, okay. And I'm rich. Uh -huh. I do, right? I mean, you don't know why they're asking me for money? Seriously? What's wrong with you? What hole did you crawl up from? I've been with you long enough. Shut up, Frank. All right. Okay. I'm allowed to say shut up because I'm pastor, right? So kids, it's not okay. But if you're pastor, you can say stupid. Dumb and shut up. Those are three things only pastors are allowed to say. Okay, I'm joking about that, guys. Okay, <laughs> just for the sake of the children. My parents are like, I don't let my kids say that, and you said it anyway. <laughs> okay, uh, why are they asking me for money? Because anybody in America has more than anybody, pretty much. 
in their country except for the maybe the percentage of 1%. And relative, rich, being rich is relative actually. And actually sometimes I ask the question, okay, could I do something to make somebody's life better because of what I have? And I'm not going to admit it to you if I ever send money to Africa or one of those places. But uh, the reality of it is, is that being rich is actually relative, isn't it? Yes. Now here's the deal, as far as, as I'm concerned. Um, I like the house that I live in. I like the vehicles that I drive. I honestly, uh, if you were to ask me, Pastor, what's something you'd like to have that you don't have? And the answer is, I'd have to think about that. Like there may be something I haven't purchased yet that I'd like to have, but if, I, if it really mattered to me, I'd probably actually have it. Realistic, I mean, I'm not rich, I'm not saying you know, I'm a millionaire or whatever, but I'm just telling you I'm pretty well satisfied with what I have. Uh, some of you have nicer vehicles than mine, but I like mine better. Some of you have nicer homes than I have, but I like mine better. I like what I have. I'm satisfied with what I have. You understand where, what I'm talking about? I was joking with the kids yesterday about I think I'm going to sell my house. I can't remember why I said that. And Luke said, don't sell your house, Pastor. I said, why? He said, because how else are you going to get on the water fast if you need to go somewhere? See, i got a boat on my davit. It's an old beater boat. But I can crank it down and I can be away in 30 seconds. And I like that. I think that's awesome. I don't care where you live. I just think that's cool. You know? And uh, it may take me hours to get anywhere on my boat, but I can go. You know? And I like that. Uh, I don't live in the best of neighborhoods. I don't live in the worst of neighborhoods, but I like my house. Amen. You say, Pastor, would you like to live somewhere else? Well, I really wouldn't care to, to be quite honest with you, unless it was a lot nicer than mine. Because actually, if I, if I were to think about it, and you were to say, Pastor, would you like to have a different house? I'd say, not really, don't really need one, but if I had a different one, I'd like it to have more bedrooms and more bathrooms. And I'd like it to have a shop and, uh, you know, not a garage. And actually, I'd like it to be a little closer to the ocean. And I, if it were closer to the ocean, then I think maybe I'd want a bigger boat. And if I had a bigger boat, um, I think maybe I would also like, and I could just start adding all the stuff to go along with it. Right? And, uh, you know, and, and there's just no end to that, actually. When you think along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as a believer, especially when God has just really blessed us. And we are blessed, actually, relatively. You like where you live? Amen. You like the vehicle you drive? Do you, I mean, we all just, we, we're kind of rich in that sense, aren't we? Aren't we? Yeah. Okay, here's a question. If you say, Pastor, give up your house, and I'll give you a hundred times better one. Will that be a good deal for me? You say, well, Pastor, you don't need a hundred times better. Yeah, but I'm just telling you if that's the deal. Give it up. Give it away, and you'll get one that's a hundred times better. I'll give it up. I'll give it away. Give up your car, and you can get one that's worth a hundred times more. So it'd be what, worth a hundred dollars? Give it up. Give it away. Uh, would you do that? Well, I think that would make sense, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd just be good economics, wouldn't it? Uh, give up your boat, and I'll give you one a hundred times better. This has a hundred times the value. Or I'll give you a hundred boats, which would appeal to me more, probably. Because, you know, I need a hundred boats. Yeah. Like I need a hole in the head. <laughs> I need a hundred fewer boats, probably. Anyway, uh, give up this, and I'll give you this. Well, it would make good sense in many ways, wouldn't it, to give up something. And Jesus is talking to the disciples here who have just seen Him interact with a man who is rich. And Jesus' response about the rich man when he went away was that it's harder or it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now there are some things we're going to look at here, but I want to look at it from a perspective, first of all, that's practical. And I want to get the practical out of the way first. And then we'll do some doctrinal after that. I know that's a little bit backward, but I want us to understand some things practically speaking. 
My friend, you and I are called very, very specifically. By the way, we are kind of the rich men who've entered the eye of the needle, relatively speaking. Isn't it so? I mean, the truth of the matter is I've met people that don't have what the, you know, the elite wealthy of the world, the billionaires, would think is a lot, but actually they have enough that they can trust their riches. They have, it doesn't, how much does it take for a person to feel provided for and taken care of and confident that what he has provides for him and it's all he needs? It can be the bare minimum, actually. It could be an RV. It could be, uh, you know, if you're a millennial, it could be parents who have a nice house. You know, it could be whatever. Right? It could be really relative. By the way, I heard something about millennials. I want to pick up millennials for a second. I haven't a chance to in a couple of weeks. Yesterday on the radio, <laughs> this is, you're going to love this, Taj. This is great. Uh, yesterday on the radio, they were advertising something and they were targeting people groups. They said, whether you're a teen, whether you're an adult, whether you're a millennial, <laughs> you're on the radio. Whether you're a teen, whether you're an adult, whether you're a millennial. <laughs> I just, I thought, well, that's great. What a great. Uh, anyway, sorry, millennials. Uh, no, I'm not really sorry. <laughs> but like, it's it his own category. You're not an adult. You're not a teen. You're just. You're, like, you're a millennial. Whatever that is. You know, never an adult. Never a teen. Just this, like, it's like this. I don't know. This void that people live in that you're, you're kind of in limbo or separation. So it's tough. How you folks thought, thought uh, it was easy for millennials. Actually, it's not. It's tough. They don't even have their own category classification or they don't fit into you know, in, in the normal phases of uh, human development. So how would you like to be 50 years old and still be a millennial? You will be. You're still not going to be an adult. You know, it's too late to be a teenager. That's rough, isn't it? Anyway, okay, that has nothing to do with the message today. I just heard it on the radio yesterday, and I thought, well, that's clever. I like that. Anyway, <laughs> I think it was about financial investment. Moving forward, Jesus told the rich man, he said, or he, he said if you want to be perfect, go and sell everything that you have, and uh, give all your goods to feed the poor, and then come be my disciple and follow me. And the disciples, when he went away, are like, whoa, man, that's too bad. That guy, you know, he has riches and so he can't follow Jesus. And they said, lo, Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. And they said, hey, we gave up everything to follow you, Jesus. I love when Jesus called his disciples. Remember this some months past? And he went by, and I mean, here are, here are these fishermen on the seashore, and Jesus said, follow me. And the Bible says they left their nets. Left their father and they followed him. Just left. And here they are saying to Jesus, We have given everything, we've left everything, and we've followed you. And Jesus made them some grandiose promises. I mean, some major promises. He said, There isn't a person, first of all, who has, uh, in, in verse 28, that ye of which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of His glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, so you followed me, but you're going to be rulers over the twelve tribes of Israel. So when Christ sets up His kingdom, you're going to actually be sitting on thrones. You're going to be kings in the kingdom. Well, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, I gave up being a fisherman, and all I get to be is a king, ruling and reigning with Christ. That's pretty good, isn't it? And then he went on to say, everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive it a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Now, can I submit to you this morning that the and shall inherit everlasting life is worth anything? that could be given up for it. In other words, if Jesus were to say, give up your house and you can have everlasting life, you can have my house. I'm just not very attached to it. You can have my lands. You can have my relationships. You can have anything because the only thing that matters actually is eternal life. 
It doesn't matter what you have. If you do not have eternal life, you have nothing that's lasting. You may have something that you are a possessor of, but my friend, you'll lose it. You cannot have anything in a permanent way until you have eternal life. And then Jesus throws all these things on top of it by saying, whatever you give for my sake, you're going to have more. You give family, you'll get family. Now this is a mystery that a lot of Christians find out. Listen, it's so real for some people. I've, I've shared the Gospel in the last six months with some Jewish folks and some Muslim folks and uh, some Catholic folks. And each in those categories have, as they've considered whether or not they want to receive Jesus as their Savior, they've just been very, very forthright in saying, if I get saved, it's it for my family. If I get saved, my family will never speak to me ever again. It's done. I don't have a family anymore. That's a pretty major consideration, actually, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, those same people would also lose their friends. They would leave, lose father, mother. Some of them would lose their spouses. I know someone right now, uh, a lady, who she's been put out of her house because she was born again, so her husband got rid of her. He says, you're dead. You don't exist anymore because you followed Jesus. And you say, Pastor, that's so tragic. That's so terrible. We can't imagine losing our families. And isn't it a wonderful thing when your family is actually family in an eternal way? Man, I'll tell you, when you have, an, when you have family who is eternally family, boy, the confidence and the security of it, you can't lose them. But my friend, hear me very, very practically this morning. If your family do not have eternal life, they're lost to you. And I do not mean in the sense that you won't love them, you won't care about them. I'm saying they're not going where you're going. And that ought to, as believers, ought to get us to the very quick of our hearts and help us to realize that we ought to value the things that are valuable. And we ought to value our family who are family according to the flesh and desire to see them to be family in the Spirit in the family of God. Listen, my friend, if you're afraid of losing family because of not preaching or because of preaching the gospel to them, will you please consider that if you don't preach the gospel to them, you'll lose them? That's such a vitally important truth. It's a simple one, and yet it needs to connect with us and help us to understand we can't have family in Christ unless they're in Christ. But here's a caveat to that as well. It, it, it may be, maybe that you'll be like some individuals. We had a tract uh, some years ago, and it had a picture of it has a picture of a man who is kneeling at the cross with an AK-47, and he was a terrorist before he got saved, but he came to Christ. And after he got saved, his father actually has, he currently has hits put out on him. In other words, he is, he is a Palestinian, and his father has paid people to kill him. There's been, there have been attempts on his life on numbers of occasions, and if his family could have what they want, he'd actually be dead. And uh, really, it, it is uh, just a, such a contrast to the way that we think sometimes. You say, Pastor, he gave up so much. Yeah, he actually did, physically speaking in earthly terms. But my friend, something we don't think about very much is how much we gain in Jesus Christ, even in this life. You never had family like a real brother or sister in Christ. Listen, if your family doesn't know Jesus, my friend, they, they may love you, they may be concerned about you, but they don't love you the same way that someone who knows Jesus could love you. They're not concerned about you in the same way that someone who loves Jesus would be concerned about you. And even in the near term, in the short term, there's nothing like the family of Christ. I think about being one of the apostles. And, and literally, the survival rate of apostles was what? Zero. One in twelve, right? As far as not being killed. No. Okay, John didn't get killed. He got boiled in oil, but it didn't kill him. So it wasn't, you know, it was a minor 
minor thing. Uh, the survival rate for the apostles was 1 in 12. Humanly speaking, of course, they all eventually died. Can you imagine the camaraderie, the kinship between the apostles and the believers, though? Can you imagine when the believers got together to worship? How much their faith meant to them and how much their brethren meant to them? It makes it all that much, all the more sweet, all the more precious. And Jesus here told the disciples, He said, practically speaking, He said, no one's ever given up anything to follow me that they have not received not only eternal life, but a hundred times whatever they gave. Amen. You know, sometimes we forget that as believers. I don't like the whiny testimonies. They frustrate me, to be honest with you. I don't like whiny Christian songs and whiny testimonies. You know, a lot of Christian music, uh, you know, is, uh, the, for instance, the through it all kind of a song. Through it all, you know, through it all, through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. I learned to trust in God. Through it all. And they talk about their trials of life and their tribulations, how life was awesome. And then Jesus died for them, and they received Jesus as their Savior, and life stank. But in spite of the fact that they gave up everything for Jesus, they're still trusting Him. They're still faithful to Him. And oh, they are persevering in it. And they will not stop, even though life has been nothing but misery from the moment they came to the Savior. But thank God He saved someone like them. Because they're faithful to Him. My friend, there's no such thing as faithfulness without God's faithfulness to us. Anything we do for Jesus is a reciprocation of faithfulness. Isn't it true? And I'll be honest with you, I, I get tired of the whiny Christian, the whiny Christian mindset. You'll hear a man get up and he'll say, you know, I used to be a businessman, and uh, you know, I I'll tell you, as far as the world's concerned, I've done so well. I've become very, very independently wealthy, and I had the cars, and I had the women, and I had the, you know, I had the houses, and I had this, and I had friends, and I had all these things, and then I gave it all up for Jesus. And let me tell you something, I don't regret it one bit. Don't regret it one bit. They never tell you anything Jesus did for them. You know, they just they just don't regret that they gave up. I mean, they had it awesome, but you know, and you just think, man, there just must be some strength in your character that makes you willing to sacrifice so much for a God who does nothing for you. <laughs> Except die on the cross for your sins and give you eternal life and a mansion in heaven and to make you rulers with Christ and give you a hundred times what you ever gave up. We've got some backward thinking sometimes, don't we? Mm. You know why a person would give up a house or a car or a land? Because it's a paltry sum in return for what God's going to give them. Why would you hold on to something pathetic? Why would you hold on to something pathetic when you can have something beyond description, amazing and wonderful. And I know we do. I know we do, but it's because our thinking's all wrong, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're backward in our mindset. Let me ask you a question, a practical question. Seriously. What if God were to put His hand on you? And He were to put a special call in your life. A call to serve Him. And what if the things that you possess didn't fit in that plan. What if? Happens all the time, doesn't it? What if you lived in a home and God said, I've got something for you, but it isn't there. It's somewhere across the globe. Or it's in another state or another city or across town. Or I need you to sell the home to get this thing started. You know, my wife and I sold our houses to start our church. It's not anything to brag about. It's just we got we had a clear call of the ministry in us, and you know we we just we they weren't they weren't they weren't anything to give up anyway. You wouldn't have lived in the houses we lived in anyway. <laughs> but the reality of it is, we moved into a motor home to start our church, and we sold our houses and we used our money that we had to start the church. And it's not our church; 
My name's not on a title somewhere. Tomorrow, Lord could call somebody else to take my place. I don't own anything here. I don't possess this. But God gave me a call. And friend, I can't give up something that has more value than that call. Can't give it up. And I want to be honest with you, I want my heart before the Lord to be tomorrow. If God said, sell your house, because I need you to use it for this, I want my heart to be, yeah, sure, it's gone. Sold. Don't need that. I can't give up anything for Jesus that I won't receive a hundred times. And friend, you and I live so often like God is trying to get us to make a sacrifice for Him. What's a sacrifice? What is it anyway? Okay, I want to analyze real quickly whether or not a rich man can be saved. And we'll start by first of all looking at Jesus' mindset. Uh, verse 13, we didn't read this in our text, but in chapter 20 or 19 of, of Matthew, in verse 13, the Bible says, Then were brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, it means allow them. Forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. He's laid his hands on them and departed thence. So they brought these little kids. And Jesus is busy. Listen, little kids are great, aren't they? I mean, all like playing with the little kids here. They're fun, aren't they? I mean, the kids to me are my favorite. They're just, you know, well, teenagers are my ultimate favorite. I love teenagers. They're the, hi, Anthony. Anthony waves at me when I said I love teenagers. He's like, hey, I'm a teenager. I love you, Anthony. <laughs> I do. I, I, just, I think teenagers are awesome. And actually, Anthony and I spend a lot of time together. And we have some good times. At least I have some good times with him. And, well, honestly, they do. It's just, I just, I love kids, though. I love kids, love teenagers. But when I'm trying to get something done, I don't have time for children. Right? I mean, it's like, you know, I'm trying to work here. You can't be playing here. Get, you know, I, later. If I'm not doing something, I've got time for, I don't have time for kids when I'm trying to do something. When we're talking, we don't want kids to interrupt us, right? Having a serious conversation, a kid comes up and is like, Pastor, you know, give me a Hershey's kiss. It's like, later, you know? I'm busy right now. You know, it's not that you don't love them, you don't value them, but, you know, it's just they're kids. So the kids come up and they, and they interrupt what Jesus is doing. And the disciples said, no kids, you know, this, hey, that's not, you know, this is not for kids here. And Jesus said, stop, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for as such as the kingdom of heaven. And we know that Jesus also said that a person who comes to God has to come with the faith of a child. Just come with a child like just God, I believe. You tell a kid about how much Jesus loves them and they died on the cross for them, it touches their heart. Does you tell a child about the sacrifice that Jesus made and how much God loves them, it just touches their heart. And then you say, you want to believe in Jesus? And they're like, well, of course. <laughs> of course I do. You tell an adult about that, and a lot of times it doesn't touch their heart. They say, well, why did Jesus need to die for me? You want to be saved? Why do I need to do that? And Jesus wants us to come like children. That's the first example. Then the Bible says a rich man came to him. A rich uh, young ruler, a rich young man. Uh, in verse, I, I love this, verse 16. I love the tone of it. I, I would like to see this as a skit or an act. Actually, it's, it's touching. Tasha, you could do this one. This could be one for you. Okay. Look at verse 16. Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Hey, Jesus, can I do something for you, you know, for eternal life? Good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Hey, Jesus, can I... Do you, you see it visually? How was Jesus dressed? What would he? What would have been His dress as far as the, the, the people group that He worked among? Uh, working clothes? Probably working clothes. He had a, a garment that was woven in one piece. You know, we know because they didn't rend it. They didn't want to tear His garment when they cast lots for it. Couldn't be taken apart. So He had, you know, like a, a robe or a, you know, something, something like that. He would have been wearing what a carpenter would wear. That would be the type of clothing Jesus would have worn. 
This man we see, the text indicates was rich. Other texts shed more light on it. But this man would have been coming before Jesus, showing things that were tokens of his wealth. He certainly would have had a signet or a ring, a, you know, a, a, a nice ring on. He would have had multiple garments, but he certainly would have had the kind of garments that distinguished him from being working class and making him wealthy or ruling class. And so I can, in my mind's eye, see Jesus telling the disciples, let the children come, and ministering to people. And I can see this man making his way to see Jesus and kind of making waves as he does so. You know, it's kind of like, oh, here's an important guy, get out of the way. You know, he walks up, he's got his nice clothing on, he's dressed in a way that indicates that he's very wealthy. And he comes to Jesus, and as he does so, I can see in his mind that he's actually condescending. He's actually like, you know, this carpenter, you know, there's something special about him, he's pretty neat, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm gonna go talk to him. And in his mind, as, he thinking, as he's thinking, he's going to go talk to him, he's actually thinking, I'm actually going to go beneath my level and speak to someone who is beneath me. And so he's going to condescend to God and offer Him something. Hey, buddy, can I get you something? <laughs> Bowl of soup, cup of, cup of coffee? What can I do for you? I've seen your ministry. I like it. I'm thinking about promoting me. You know, if I take you on, you could go places. I mean, literally, that's the attitude he comes to Jesus. Good master, what good thing must I do to... Hey, you know, I'll do something for you for eternal life. And so Jesus answered him in kind. Now, if you think that Jesus here is saying you get eternal life by keeping the law, no one's ever kept the law, first of all. We know that. But Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? Why did you call me good? He said, There is none good but one that is God. He said, Only God's good. So if you're calling me good, you're also acknowledging that I'm God. And he said, Speaking of good... If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Just keep all the commandments. That's all you need to do for me. If I'm God, and you undo something for me, just keep all the commandments. That's all. <laughs> he said, then in which? Well, Jesus said all the commandments, didn't He? Okay, so all of them. So Jesus just scratched the ones He didn't keep and mentioned the ones He figured the guy had kept. He said, uh, here you go. Uh, thou shalt do no murder. Don't kill anybody. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't commit adultery. And thou shalt not steal. And thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, actually, most Jews, most Pharisees hadn't actually physically broken these commandments. Most of the average Pharisees hadn't murdered anybody. Most of them hadn't gone to court and testified against someone. Most of them had not had a, a relationship that was adulterous. Uh, and most of them had honored their father and their mother. I mean, if he's an average good guy, he's average and he wouldn't have done... You know, the average decent guy doesn't do these things, right? So Jesus basically boiled all the law down, keeping all the law to... You know, the one that everybody that thinks they don't need to be saved thinks, well, I'm not a bad person because I've done these things or I haven't done these things. You know, hey, how many times you shared the gospel? Like, well, I'm not a bad person. I've never killed anybody. You know, well, I never, you know, I've, I've never committed adultery. Well, I've never, you know, and some people have. But the reality of it is, is that Jesus said, or I mean, but is that most people, you know, could say, I haven't done, people that think they're good people haven't done these things, right? And then Jesus said, And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? He said, I've done all these things from the time I was a kid. I've always, I've always done this. Now here's a couple of interesting things that we need to focus on. First of all, that man knew in his heart that though he had done 
All of these things, though he was a good person, he knew there's a reason he came to Jesus and said, what good things shall I do that I can inherit eternal life? In other words, he knew it wasn't enough. He knew that there was something missing in his heart. And so he said, what am I lacking? And so Jesus just told him, he said, just, just all you're lacking is everything. Uh, if thou wilt be perfect, verse 21, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. <laughs> but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Start off today asking, what would you give up in order to have more? Jesus here is not saying to this man, give up everything and you'll never have anything anymore, and then I'll let you have eternal life. But that's certainly the way the young man thought that Jesus was speaking to him. The tragedy of it is that this man sees his possessions as eradicating him wholly of any need. One of the most tragic things, one of the things that keeps people from being born again more than anything else is not being able to see your need. All oh, neediness, my friend, is one of the best things you can ever have. There's something about a beggar that God likes. And it's really true. I don't like the idea of being a beggar, do you? I like to say, you know what David said, I've been young, I've been old, and I have not seen the righteous forsaking, forsaken or his seed begging for bread. And I understand that when God is your Father, you don't have need of anything. God provides those things. But friend, when you come to God, you've got to come like a beggar. God, the only thing that I really need I don't have, and the only way I can get it is if you give it to me. And I can't earn it. I can't do anything for it. You've just got to give it to me. And the tragedy of this man was that he thought that he could earn eternal life. What good thing can I do to have eternal life? And the truth of the matter is not a thing in the world. There's nothing you can do to have eternal life. But what this man had was a hold on to the notion that the things he possessed could buy him whatever he needed, including eternal life. And my friend, it isn't so. Can I say to you, nothing that you can hold on to first of all, is eternal. And nothing you can hold on to can purchase for you those things which are eternal. And that's the tragedy of this young man. When he went away, Jesus discussed with His disciples the hindrances this man had. In verse 23, Then said Jesus unto His disciples, Verily or truly, I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the word hardly has two understandings. Hardly means it's not going to happen, but hardly means by the very most difficult way possible. In other words, the way that a rich man enters is the hard way. Jesus said, a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And he said, here's how difficult it is. And again, I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Somewhere, some guy came up with the notion that the phrase eye of a needle has a Middle Eastern historic understanding of a gate where a camel would kneel and crawl through a gate. Now, I'm not a camel expert, and I actually don't want to be. I think camels smell. I think they're mangy. I think they're stinky, and though I recognize they have great value in some areas of the world, I don't value them hardly at all. I like camels less than I like horses. And I like horses way less than I like four-wheelers. And so i just tell you where camels are at on my list. So I don't claim to be a camel expert. I don't even like them. When I go uh, to a, a fair where they're giving camel rides, I've never been tempted to get on a camel, you know, and go for a ride, and far less to pay for a ride on a camel. I'm not saying we'll never do that. I'd rather do that than go to Disney World. But I've never gone to Disney World either, so I probably won't do that. Now, these are my personal opinions. All I'm saying is I want to qualify by telling you I'm not a camel expert. If it were true that a camel would pass through gates, 
by getting on his knees and crawling under a bar, as some people say, then I will say it's not easy for a camel to go through, the, through an eye of a needle. The problem with that whole teaching is that I've never found anyone who can ever substantiate where they say they learned that. I think some guy made that up one time and then everybody quoted them. Because I can't find who the first guy is. So I've heard people say, well, when the Bible says the eye of a needle, it's not really an eye of a needle. It's actually a fence. It's a gate. And it's too bad the Holy Spirit didn't have good enough grammar to say gate or fence and to crawl under that. But uh, actually, I think it means what it says, that it's the eye of a needle. And I think it would be very, very difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And Jesus said that's very, very hard. And it is. However, however, Jesus said it's more difficult for a camel uh, to go, or it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And I think that's really true. And so here's, here's our understanding, our doctrinal understanding of it. If you believe that the Scripture is talking about a gate when it says needle, and eye of a needle, if you think it's talking about a gate, uh, then what you're saying is it's difficult. If you're talking about it being a needle and a camel going through the eye of a needle, then could we say it's impossible? Mm -hmm. You've got you to gotta make a cam camel, like break him down pretty well to get him through <laughs> an eye of a needle, right? I'm not saying that couldn't be done, but providing it's a big needle, you'd have to squeeze him pretty hard. So we could say it's impossible. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. Because the reality of it is nobody gets to heaven without seeing themselves as needy. And no one who thinks he's rich sees himself as needy. But a rich man is actually relative, isn't he? Isn't he? I mean, could you live in the nicest area of Fort Lauderdale in the best of houses and see yourself as needy? Yeah. You sure could. Could you live in an average area of Fort Lauderdale and see yourself as rich? You sure could. See, this matter of rich, my friend, is actually perspective, isn't it? If I compare myself with the people that haunt me on Facebook, I am wealthy. And it's undeniably so. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, obviously, if I gave them all 50 bucks, I wouldn't have very much money uh, after, you know, 5,000 of them or so. You know, I'd be, I'd be in trouble. And if I gave them 50 bucks every day, like they would want me to, if I gave them 50 bucks one day, then, it, you know, it's not sustainable. But honestly, when they look at me and they see a picture of me next to my old boat, they think, man's rich, he's got a boat. <laughs> Because they don't have a boat. They see me next to a motorcycle. Man's rich, he's got a motorcycle. Man's rich, he's got a four-wheeler. Man's rich, he's got a truck. Man's rich, he's got a car. He's got more than one car. He's got shoes. He's got more than one change of clothes. He's got a house. He's got, and, and, and actually, comparatively speaking, it's true, isn't it? I mean, I have so much more than they have. And you know... It's very easy for us to actually think of ourselves as rich and to think of ourselves as having need of nothing. And Jesus said, you know, a rich man doesn't go to heaven. A camel could get through the eye of a needle more easily than a rich man could get to heaven. And a camel can't get through the eye of a needle, my friend. In other words, any person who goes to heaven, regardless of what the possessions are that God has entrusted him with, needs Jesus. You know, we're so prideful. You know, if I were to ask you today, even as a Christian, do you need anything? Most of us would probably say, I'm all right. No, I'm okay. I don't need anything. And you know, if it actually came right down to it, we actually do need some things, don't we? We need some things that man can't provide and only God can. But in our minds, so often we're too rich to ask. I don't need anything. I can take care of it. I can handle it. 
And we have a God who literally is able to, anything we give up for Him, give us a hundred times. We have a God who's able to provide for us. And we just think that the things that we have aren't important enough to ask Him because we don't see ourselves as needy. And my friend, you'll never get born again unless you see your need for a Savior. And you'll never have God work in your life unless you see yourself as needy. Do you hear me today? And if I could convince you of something today, I'd like to convince you that you're not as rich as you think you are. That you don't have as much as you think you have. And that actually if you gave up what you have, you could have a lot more. Because that is a, an inherent truth that has to do with the kingdom of heaven. What about it? If I were to ask you, are you rich? Well, compared to some maybe. But you know what? Let's go ahead and make the comparison that is right in front of our eyes. Who was the rich young really speaking to? God. God. He's speaking to God. How did they compare as far as wealth goes? <laughs> you just, all you can do is laugh. Like, <laughs> okay, some guy that has temporal life who is entrusted with things that actually belong to God and is merely a steward of those things so long as he can hold on to them thinks he's got more than Jesus does. Thinks he can do something for Jesus. And he should have just come and said, Jesus, can you give me eternal life? I need it. Jesus could say, what do you have? What do you give me? He said, I, I can only give you everything I have. And you know what Jesus said? You give me everything you have, I'll give you a hundred times that. Forever can't hold on to things you have, but if you give me everything you have, I'll give you a hundred times it forever. And tragically, that man thought, I can't afford that. I can't give you that. And he went away sorrowful because he had too much. My friend, if you have anything that would keep you from eternal life, you've got too much. You're too rich. You better be off. You'd be better off being poor. You'd be better off having nothing. You know, sometimes people ask me the question, Pastor, why is it in third world countries when the gospel's preached, so many people get saved? Because, my friend, they know they have a need. They know they're needy. Even in those places, there are those that do not see themselves as having a need. But I'd rather preach the gospel to a poor man than to a rich man. I don't care whether it's a poor man that has a million dollars or a rich man that has 50 bucks. Because that's relative, isn't it? Relative to what you think about yourself and what you think about God. And this man's problem was he thought Jesus was poor and he thought he was rich. When actually, <laughs> in comparison, he was an absolute pauper. And he was speaking to the king of the world. How do you compare? You know what? I might serve God. I might do something for Him. You know? I mean, I'd like to further His kingdom. You know, it doesn't seem like many people are on Jesus' bandwagon, you know? And, uh, you know, maybe I could promote Him a little bit. Maybe I could do something for God. Get the word out, you know? That's ridiculous, isn't it? He's God. And it's a privilege, my friend, to set aside everything that you think you have and to serve Him for what He can do for you. Salvation and eternal reward. That's who God is. Father, I pray that the truth of what we've seen in the Scripture would impact our thinking in a way that we would actually practically understand how great our need is. Before we begin our invitation this morning, I want to ask that everyone would just keep, uh, for the respect and the privacy of everyone else, Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'd like to ask this morning just a really practical question. You always ought to ask it, really, because we don't know the hearts of a person. 
As far as I know, every person in this room this morning has trusted Jesus as their Savior. And you know that your eternal life rests in what Christ has done and not anything you could do for Jesus. You hear this morning, though, and you'd say, you know, Pastor, I'm not sure I have eternal life. I'm not sure I've ever been born again. I don't know uh, that I've ever put my faith in Christ alone rather than trusting my works or thinking that I could do something for God. And I've seen from the rich man today the problem of a perspective of riches. God's convicted me about that today, and I, I need to be born again. I need to humble myself and recognize He has everything, and I need what He can give me, eternal life. Pastor, pray for me. Don't call me out or embarrass me, but I'll slip my hand up right now and ask you to pray for me about the matter of my eternal salvation. Just slip your hand up if that's you here this morning. Okay? Slip right back down. Second area. Second question. You might be here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, sometimes I realize that my system of values, I'm not simply content with what I have. I actually think I'm rich. And from that perspective, I think that God needs something from me rather than I need something from God. And I've realized today that no person who thinks he's rich has anything in the kingdom of heaven. And I recognized when I got saved that I needed salvation, and so I know that's settled. But I've fallen into that same mindset that the rich young ruler had, that I can do something for God when actually I need God to do something for me. Pastor, God showed me this, and as practically as I can, I want to sort it out in my life, and I want to change my mindset about this matter of being rich. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. Pastor, God, show me this. Yeah, slip up right back down. I need a change in my mindset. Okay, here's what I want you to do. You're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. Then uh, it's really as simple, as simple of a matter as calling on the name of the Lord. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. No person gets to heaven because of good works or because of self-righteousness. Any person who has eternal life has eternal life because God's given it to them as a free gift. And you get that gift by asking, by calling on the name of the Lord. When I received Jesus as my Savior, I didn't pray a special prayer. I just told God what was on my heart. And you could do the same thing. You would acknowledge, first of all, because of your sin that you have a need. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And you could say, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I deserve death for my sin. But then the second part of Romans 6.23 is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know how you get a gift from God? You get it by asking. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. You can't do something for it. You simply ask for it. And you could just pray and say, God, I want eternal life because of what Jesus did for me. Not doing anything for you, I'm asking you to save me. And if you do that, God will save you just by saying those words. I'd like, to, I'd like just to have a moment, just a second, a few seconds, to allow anyone that would like to ask Jesus to save them to do that. That's the most important thing you could do today. And then I'd like to finish our invitation. If everyone here uh, would please just stand to your feet, I want to sing a song of invitation today. We're going to sing Just As I Am. And you know, I think that's an appropriate song, an appropriate way to come to Jesus. It's page 249 of the Blue Hymn Books, if you don't know it. And as we sing, as we begin our song of invitation, I think everyone here is familiar enough with the invitation to know that you can just come to Jesus. Maybe you'd like to kneel where you're at or just bow your head instead of singing and pray. And then just tell God what's on your heart because it does us no good to have God speak to us unless we respond to Him, just as I am.
isn't it amazing how fast you can tell God, God, what you've said to me is true, and God, I acknowledge it, and I submit to it, and how fast God can do business with you. Well, you don't have to have a long, drawn-out prayer and say, God, please hear me, and uh, talk and talk and talk and talk. No, you can just tell God what's on your heart. And just like that, you'll have a change in mindset. You'll have a difference in your standing before the Lord. Isn't it wonderful how easy it is to have a relationship with a God who's rich in everything when we come to Him recognizing that we have need of everything? Thank you so much for being here today. And I trust that the preaching of the Word of God has impacted your life and that it will have an impact on you for this week. I don't know what God will do with it in individual lives, but I know that for me the realization of what Jesus is saying in this text of the Scripture has been a reminder to me to recognize my need. Now, you ask me sometimes, hey, do you need anything? My answer is, man, everybody needs everything from me. I don't need anything from anybody. And the reality of it is, is that, no, I need Jesus. And I need everything from Jesus. And no person who sees himself as being the one who can do something for God, ever has God do anything for him. I want to unlock a key spiritual truth that's actually transforming. That's one for you. And I trust that God will use it in your life this week. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Taj if you'll dismiss us with a word of prayer, please. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for what you've taught us in your word, Lord. Thank you for the ability that we've had to come here and worship you and hear your preaching. And now, God, I just pray that you will uh, help us, Lord, as we go our separate ways to remember what you've taught us this morning, be ready to come back to church tonight, and the Lord continue to learn more about you so we can serve you better. And the Lord, we can give our lives to you. We ask your blessing on us now, we pray in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.